The scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. Jesus raises a dead girl and heals a sick woman. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and lived. So Jesus went with him. A large cloud crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding around you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. If we know anything about Jesus, we know that he was about the business of his father in reaching out to touch the lives of others, to bring hope and meaning and purpose to the lives of people. And he indeed was the great physician. And I suspect there are many of you that are sitting here in this sanctuary today have experienced the healing that can come to our lives through Christ. And you know of people who have great testimonies that can tell of how God has walked with them and made a difference in their lives and their own healing. 
Recently, I read where a doctor in Chicago asked a very important question. He asked, what is the healthiest hour of the week? The healthiest hour of the week. He asked other physicians and nurses and others in the health care industry, what is the healthiest hour of the week? What would you say if someone were to ask you that question? Would you say, well, the healthiest hour for me is reading the newspaper? Probably not. Would the healthiest hour be watching the latest news? Probably not. Would the healthiest hour be watching the latest golf competition or NASCAR? Uh, probably better than the news and all, but probably not. Uh, or the latest fishing show? I probably could identify with that a little bit. Or the lightning? Probably close, but not. The answer may surprise some of you, but probably not you or I. The healthiest hour of the week, according to this detail, was the hour of worship on Sunday morning. The healthiest hour of the week. So we need to tell our friends that, don't we? If you want to find healing and hope, be in church somewhere, worship for one hour on Sunday morning. It can bring healing to you. Well, I like that, of course, as a pastor. I like those kinds of polls that are taken that affirm what we are about as a people of faith. Why do you think doctors and nurses, when asked, responded with Sunday worship hours, the most healthiest hour of the week? Perhaps the medical field was onto something when they discovered that when they began to ask, what is the major cause of illness? or what is a major factor in health, apparently one study suggested that the major cause of sickness is none other than revenge. Revenge. That's rather shocking, isn't it? That that seems to be a motivating force, or some seems to be some heavy weight in the hearts of people. Major cause of sickness is none other than revenge. I, I find that shocking, but in reality, not surprising if you spend time thinking about it or if you happen to listen to the news. In fact, one survey among stroke victims revealed that many of them had admitted that they did feel a certain amount of revenge towards certain other people in their lives. Now, that's a hard confession, but must be some truth in it. The study showed that in many cases there was a repressed feeling, an attitude instead of an expressed action. But let me also say that in the same study it was determined that a major factor in staying healthy was an attitude of gratitude. Attitude of revenge, attitude of gratitude. Make your choice. We live in a complicated society, a complicated world. But I firmly believe that if we can adopt an attitude of gratitude in our lives, we can live longer. We can live longer and healthier. And happier and we can be more fulfilled in life you and I both know individuals who have carried something on their heart for years I'll never forget the story of mr. Willie who was one of my parishioners he lived across the street from his son but they never spoke. The son didn't particularly like the way the Mr. Willie had divided some of the property. And so there was a brokenness in their relationship. And I'll never forget the day I received word that Mr. Willie was 
going to go home to be with the Lord soon. So I went and knocked on the door of his son because I thought that he needed to know. And I knew of the brokenness in that relationship and I desperately wanted to see some healing brought to that family. I knocked on the door. I spoke to the son and I told him, I said, you know, I just got word that your dad is at the hospital. He's not doing well. He most likely will not survive. I need you to know that in case you want to go spend time with him. And I left. It never happened. It never happened. Opportunity was given. But this individual chose not to give it up, to find healing. And he most likely carried that to his grave. Life is precious, folks. Life is important. Life is, is too short to spend worrying about things that don't matter. But many people get so wrapped up in this. And there are broken relationships. I'm sure you have them in your family as I do in mine. And no matter how we want that healing to come, it's not on us, it's on them. They have to make that decision. Maybe the psalmist was right when they declared, praise is comely for the upright. Praise. And with a heart of gratitude and an attitude of, of gratitude, much more can be accomplished in this world. The brokenness that we see in our society today among people can be brought in the healing name of Christ if people will trust God. So let me suggest to you that worship at its best is important. That hour of worship on Sunday is important. But also let me suggest to you the opportunity that the, to resolve conflict through prayers of forgiveness and a focus on reconciliation is, is a part of that worship. And if you've come here today with a burden of uh, that you're carrying, I want to say to you, you don't have to leave with it. You don't have to leave with that burden. You can leave it right here in this place. You can turn it over to the Lord. You see, the church is to be a demonstration of a healing community. That's when we should be uh, in front of the world. Healing of our brokenness, our struggles, our pain, our moments of desperation, our questions. Now, I've been in the ministry for a long time. But I can also say that the church has also been the capacity to be less than the healing community it should be. Churches must not become legalistic or judgmental which can result in sickness individuals. In the years of ministry, I've seen just about everything you could imagine in, happen in a church. Conflicts over carpet colors or wall colors or furniture or hours of worship or orders of worship or hymns. <laughs> Amazing what we get all wrapped up in. God wants better for us. He wants the very best to be offered to Him in our times of worship. I like what someone said, the church can only be at its best when the members center on and conform themselves to Jesus, the healer. That's when we are at our best, when we focus 
on the healer of all. And that's to be our focus on Christ, that the divine healer of all. In fact, our story from Mark today is about the divine healer. Here we have this woman who had been ill for a dozen of years, a nobody to most people, but she had heard about Jesus. And she said to herself, if I, could just, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I would be made whole. She believed. And she stepped out in faith. Went through the crowd. Pressed her way through the crowd. And she reached out. And she touched the hem of his garment. And immediately the scriptures tell us something miraculous. He happened. And Jesus knew that. And the disciples are looking at Jesus. What do you mean, Lord? With all these people pressing on us, you're asking who touched us? Jesus said, yes. Who touched me? And he looked around. And then his eyes gazed on this one woman. My guess is she was smiling. My guess is she was happy. My guess is she knew something had changed in her life. And she was excited about it. You know, when God does something for you in your life, You don't keep it to yourself, do you? You get excited. You get happy. You, you want the world to know that something has happened and made a difference in your life. And you're excited about it and you're happy. Because you know God has shown up in your life and made a difference. If only I could touch him of his garment, I'll be healed. And healing came to her. And what an amazing story. She came just as she was. She met Jesus on that day just as she was. Her life was changed forever. And that is what happens when you seek out Jesus in your life. Everything changes. So ask yourself, what do you need, what do I need to have changed in my life? Think about it. What did Jesus say to her, daughter? Your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. If we are to be an extension of Jesus' ministry in the world, then we need to be a people with compassion for others. And I know how tough that can, can be for us. With all the imperfections and sins and blemishes and warts. The church of Jesus Christ is the intended healer of the world's wounds. The church is the intended healer of the world's wounds. We are called to be compassionate, wounded healers. Perhaps Henry Nouwen, the Roman Catholic theologian, has said, this better, has said this better than anyone else. Compassion, he says, is not pity. Pity lets us stay at a distance. It is condescending. Compassion is not sympathy. Sympathy is for superiors over inferiors. Compassion is not charity. Charity is for the rich to continue their status over the poor. Compassion is born of God. It means entering into the other person's problems. It means taking on the burdens of the other. It means standing on the other person's standing in the other person's shoes. It's the opposite of professionalism. It is a humanizing way to deal with people, just as bread without love can bring war instead of peace. Professionalism without compassion will turn forgiveness into a gimmick. Jesus was compassion. He entered into 
fellowship with people. They knew that he knew how they felt. That's the task of a healing community. What will you do in this world to help bring healing among people of all ages and races and stations in life? What will we do, church? God is calling us to be compassionate. We are to be the wounded healers. Wounded healers who suffer themselves, according to Nowen. Wounded healers who are willing to pay the price of entering into others' lives instead of just giving advice. Wounded healers who are aware of the loneliness of suffering because they've been there. Wounded healers making their own wounds into a source of healing by helping people share. Wounded healers dividing and sharing the pain of others. That's a tall order. That's a tall order for the church. But if we want to be here another 130 years, we've got to live up. I can imagine now you taking this message back to where you live, to your family, to your neighbors, wherever you are, and talk about being a wounded healer and asking people, do you see yourself as a wounded healer? Do you see yourself as an instrument of God that's bringing hope and healing and purpose and hope and life to people around us? It's not no easy task, folks. And then Jesus moved from that crowd that morning to a daughter who had died. And he reached out and he touched her took her by the hand. She woke. She walked. She talked. She ate. The miracles of God never cease to amaze us what God can do. And it starts with wounded healers like yourself. It starts with you. What if the friends of this family were not compassionate enough to go and tell Jesus? What if this little lady who pressed herself through the crowd had become fearful of those around her and just stayed home? Wounded healers, that's who we are. That's our identity as a church. That's what we're called to be. That's our identity. How will we live that out? That rests on you. I have to find my way. You have to find your way. The need is great. The brokenness of the world is counting on wounded healers like you and like me. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your word that challenges us to reach out with compassion to others that we might offer words of hope and love and, and grace and peace. We pray, oh God, that you will guide us as wounded healers to those who desire healing. In your holy name we pray, and all God's people said,